Welcome to our ninth Cornerstone Connection lesson this quarter. On our panel today, we have Brenda, Silas, Ashley, and Tisha Jonan. On orchestra today, we have Elsie, Ashlyn, and Mpisi, and Joyce will be doing sign language today. I am Valerie Precious. I'll be taking you through the mission. And before we start, let us buy it for a word of prayer. Oh God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for being with us thus far. As we're about to start, may your spirit be with us. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. So our mission for today's title is called Heart for Preaching. When Da Costa was seven years old, he went to a special children's program in the African country of Ghana. It was summertime, and he and 290 other children stayed in rented dormitories for a fun weekend. On Sabbath, a 10-year-old girl named Gifty preached about the second coming of Jesus. Da Costa liked the sermon very much. He couldn't wait to see Jesus come in the clouds of glory. After the sermon, an adult asked the children, how many of you would like to preach like Gifty? If you would like to, tell your parents and join the preacher's club. Da Costa had never heard about the preacher's club, but he thought, if that girl can preach, I can preach too. A few Sabbaths later, Da Costa learned at his own church that a new preacher's club would meet at three o'clock in the afternoon. He remembered his desire to preach like 10-year-old Gifty, and he went to the first meeting of the club. The teacher challenged him and other children to memorize John 14.1. Come back next Sabbath and recite from memory, the teacher said. Da Costa worked hard to memorize the verse that week. He couldn't understand why he needed to memorize a verse when he just wanted to learn to preach, but he memorized it anyway. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, he repeated over and over. On Sabbath afternoon, he recited the verse perfectly. Other children also recited the verse. The teacher was pleased. He told the children to memorize Psalm 100. Da Costa worked hard to memorize the five verses of Psalm 100 that week. He couldn't understand why he needed to memorize verses when he just wanted to learn to preach, but he memorized them anyway. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands, he repeated over and over from Psalm 100. Serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. On Sabbath afternoon, he recited Psalm 100 perfectly. Other children also recited the chapter. The teacher was very pleased. He gave the children more Bible verses. After some time, the teacher announced a special children's Sabbath. Ten churches would get together to celebrate. The teacher asked Da Costa to preach a sermon about Jesus' parable on the prodigal son. When Da Costa agreed, several weeks later, when he preached his first sermon, he understood why the teacher had asked him to memorize so many Bible verses. Because he had worked hard to memorize the verses, it was easy to remember the sermon. Church leaders were very pleased with the sermon, and they said Da Costa should preach again. Da Costa next preached for seven days in a row at children's evangelistic meetings. At the end of seven days, five people gave their hearts to Jesus and were baptized. Da Costa couldn't believe his eyes. God somehow had used his preaching to lead five people to give their hearts to him. Today, Da Costa is 14 years old, and he loves to preach. He is glad that when he was a little boy, he had a 10-year-old girl preach. God used that someone to spark a desire in his heart to preach, and now he plans to become an evangelist and maybe also a mechanical engineer. He hopes that every boy and girl who hears his story will also think about preaching. Just try, he says. Memorize Bible verses and prepare a someone to win souls for Christ.
Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone to our ninth Cornerstone lesson for this fourth quarter of 2023. And before we begin our lesson, I'd just like to introduce the panel from my right. Hello, my name is Ash. My name is Brenda, and I hope we'll be able to enjoy our lesson today. All right. Now that we know each other, oh, my name is Jonan Magana, and I'd like to ask Silas to pray with us before we begin. Amen. 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 Thank you, Silas. So our lesson is titled, A Sad End. Um, you might be wondering whose sad end it is, considering our previous lesson was titled Running, and it was about David running away from King Saul. Now, today's lesson is a sad end, but we need to know whose sad end, whose sad end is it? Is it David's or is it Saul's? But before we go there, just a bit of a background to our story. When David was chased by King Saul, we know that he went out of Israel, right? He was in exile. But he went and made an allegiance with the Philistines, who were his enemies. But throughout his roams, at one point, uh, David and his men, they had a city called Ziklag. We see that in the uh, book of First Samuel, okay, chapter 28. So one time that city was taken, and David's wives and children and his men's uh, belongings, their livestock and everything, they were taken away. And David, we see that he went and uh, he recaptured them and brought them back home. So our lesson starts at a point where David is celebrating victory after defeating the Amalekites who had taken his belongings. But then there's also a sad aspect to it. But before we get into that, I'd like to ask um, Silas to take us through the what do you think section. So the what do you think section is asking what would you like better, a uh, beginning of a journey or an end of a journey? Mm -hmm. For me, I'd like the end because <laughs> that's when you you see the happiness, you you see the enjoyment of the journey you've been through, and mm -hmm. and you reflect and appreciate what you've had. All right. Yeah. Okay, Brenda, what do you think? What's better, the beginning or the end of a journey? A long journey, to be specific. Mm. For me personally, I, uh, I enjoy the beginning of a, of a long journey because mm -hmm. if you think about it, the end of a, a long journey specifically is very tiring. You're tired and it, this, you, you don't have really the energy to enjoy the end of it. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, you're expectant of what will happen during the journey Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of energy and psych, so I personally like the beginning more than the end. The beginning, all right. Ashley, what do you think? I prefer a bit of both, actually. Uh, the beginning because it signifies that I'm about to start something new, that mm -hmm. I'm about to take on new challenges, encounter new things. And I also prefer the end in a way because it signifies that after all this, at the end of the day, I'm finally done mm -hmm. and just it becomes a repeated cycle after the end of a long journey begins a new one. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, okay, that's a very um, wise thought for that, thank you for that. Now let's uh, read Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 8, so we see what Solomon speaks about this. Let me just read it, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8, it says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So Solomon's um, thought about the journey is he'd prefer the end of a journey than the beginning. Probably has his own reasons, but uh, anyway, we'll see why. Now let us move to our story for today, and I'd like Brenda to lead us through it. And uh, it comes from first version, second Samuel, chapter one. Brenda. Okay. So the into the story part, um, when you go and look, f apart from looking at it in the lesson, if you look at it from the Bible, it, is, uh, it has a title called the Song of the, Bo of the Bow. Mm. Yeah? And this basically, I did a bit of research on it, and I found out this means 
a song of victory, but also a song of uh, um, mourning, mm. basically. And for David, this was a very important, uh, it was very important to him that him and his men did this. And it says that uh, the song of Baal was the beauty of Israel being slain. Mm -hmm. And in this song, David showed the great love and the generosity in his heart towards Saul. It showed that David didn't kill Saul with a sword in his heart. He saw beauty in Saul and he wanted no one to rejoice over the death of Saul. So in summary, the whole story of today is talking about how David was mourning Saul and mm -hmm. Gen Jonathan. And this is, like you said, this is after the victory with the Amalekites. But even in, within that victory, he did not want anyone, even though he, they were his enemies, people who wanted him dead, apart from Jonathan. So I'm talking about Saul. Yeah. Um, he didn't want anyone else to start uh, singing praises for his death. Instead, he wanted people to mourn with him because in the end of, at the end of the day, Saul was, at some point, the chosen of God. Mm. And he didn't want anyone to look down on that. So he, uh, the whole story is basically talking about um, mourning your enemies. You shouldn't pray for them to die or anything bad to happen for them. You should just want them to be... Uh, be at peace. So it is the lesson majorly learned from this and what I feel David felt when all these events came together, the death of Saul. And even in the earlier chapter, in chapter one of, uh, in the beginning verses of chapter one, he, uh, he scolds the man who killed Saul. He tells him, how, how are you rejoicing this when the blood of the king is on your hands? Mm -hmm. So it just shows how David felt overall as a person in his heart and physically and the example he put out to his men. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you for that, Brenda. Thank you for that summary. Actually, something very interesting is uh, from First Samuel chapter 28, verse 4, where we can just uh, go there. First Samuel 28, verse 4. I'll ask uh, Brenda, you can read for us. First Samuel 28, verse 4. So we see where this this battle took place between the Philistines and the Israelites because there's something very significant about that place. Brenda? Okay, uh, for Samuel 28, verse 4, and it says, Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. Mm, okay. Now, this might come as a surprise for some of us, but this very place, there's something very significant that happened uh, to the children of Israel again regarding battle. That is in the book of Judges chapter 7, when Gideon was going to fight again mm -hmm. the Amalekites, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is the same place that the Lord asked Gideon to take his 300 men, his army, so that he could thin down to 300 men, and ask them to drink water from a river. This was the very same place that that took place. But then we see two very different um, things that happened at this valley. The very first time the battle happened there, the Israelites won. But the second time, we see that they lost. All right. So that's something important I'd like to point out. And then something else about David's lament. There is, there is something about having a juicy story. All right? You have the tea. All right? mm. It might be a sad thing to other people, but you take the joy out of it. Now, David, in his lament, he says, Tell it not to Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. These are the major cities of the Philistines. So he was warning the Israelites, do not go around saying how badly we've been beaten in battle because it gives joy to the enemy. Okay? So this is a reprimand to us as well. We should watch our mouths. What do we speak about in times of sadness or in times when great things have happened? We should watch how we speak and who we speak it to. Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. Um, probably Brenda, you mm -hmm. can uh, just guide us through, through about uh, two questions from the What Do You Think section. Yeah. Uh, so I was going through the what do you think section and um, two specific questions caught my mind, uh, my eyes. Uh, the first one was who is the main character in this passage? Mm. Uh, for me personally, I don't think there was one main character because uh, David was the speaker of the song. He's the person who's basically narrating what yeah. is in this uh, verses. But the main characters within his song was, Dave, uh, was Jonathan and Saul. So I feel like there wasn't a direct main character, but if we were to pick one was, I think, David and Saul, mostly. David, so. Ashley, what do you think?
Uh, yes. So I agree on the bit of Saul because most of the lamentation is David telling them not to proclaim Saul's death to other nations uh, because then they will celebrate the death of one of their enemies, rulers, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Probably another question, like um, the last one maybe. Yeah, what lessons can you learn from this passage? Mm -hmm. uh, before I say mine, Silas King, what do you think? What, what major lesson do you get from the whole story of David's lament on Saul? Okay, I think that David's lament on Saul means he valued, he saw Saul as the chosen one of God and not as his enemy. So for, for my lesson is that it doesn't matter how wrong someone treats you what matters is, are they God's children or not? Mm. Right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was um, that the biggest thing that I think, it came to a shock to me at first because David was mourning his enemy, someone who wanted him, constantly wanted him dead. And I feel the biggest thing we can, the biggest lesson we can draw from this is that we shouldn't wish ill on our enemies, we should just pray for them. Because David, through the whole time he was at odds with Saul, mm -hmm. there is not one time he wished to do him evil, not mm -hmm. a single time. And even when he died, he scolded the one who killed him. So instead of wishing bad on our enemies, we should pray for them, mm -hmm. you know, speak well of them, even if it hurts us. Because in a way, this kind of brought um, a standard to the people around David. Mm -hmm. He was being an example, and if we want to be examples to the rest of the world as Christians, we have to do it by how we act around people who hate us or how we speak. The same way David was like, don't speak ill in front of your enemies, the same with us. We should learn to talk in a way that will influence others, in a way that we want them to be like Jesus. Amen, amen. Yeah. And that actually just speaks um, directly to the hymn that you just played before, you know, he mm -hmm. leadeth me. David trusted in God to just guide his every single action that he took. I mean, every time before he went to battle with Goliath, he prayed. Before he went to battle with the Amalekites again, he prayed. In dealing with Saul, he always prayed to God. So many of the Psalms that David wrote, especially Psalm 23, one of the most popular Psalms, David wrote it when he was out in exile. So David always trusted in God. That is something you can also pick from that. Um, Silas, you can uh, read for us the key text so you can learn something from that as well. That is uh, from Second Samuel chapter one, verse eleven and twelve. For those who do not have the lesson, Second Samuel chapter one, verse eleven and twelve. Okay, Second Samuel chapter one, verse eleven and twelve says, "Therefore David took hold of his own clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him, and they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul." And for Jonathan his son, for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. We can combine that with the flashlight as well. I'd like Ashley to just take us through the flashlight and probably what Ellen White speaks about David's actions and his reaction towards Saul's death. And it says... David seemed to be cut off from every human support. All that he held dear on earth had been swept from him. Saul had driven him from his country. The Philistines had driven him from the camp. The Amalekites had plundered his city. His wives and children had been made prisoners, and his own familiar friends had banded against him and threatened him even with death. In this hour of utmost extremity, David, instead of permitting his mind to dwell upon these painful circumstances, looked earnestly to God for help. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, from this, uh, we can see that at one of David's lowest points, he put his faith wholly in God, in which previously he hadn't. Um, just kind of digging further into this, mm -hmm. uh, when David first sought refuge in the land of the Philistines, that was just a moment in which he doubted God, a moment in which he lacked enough faith uh, to say that God would protect him wherever he encamped. Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, the Amalekites coming to raid and plunder his camp was the result of him putting his faith in the enemy, mm. of him putting the safety of the camp and all their stuff um, in the hands of the enemy and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, that is very interesting as well, because um, you see this whole alliance fell apart. Uh, this is, David did not trust in God, and we've seen that time and time again in the Bible, where people who have had great faith in God, who have shown great faith, at one point or another, they just fail to trust him. Abraham, case in point, when he did not have a son, right? But what do we learn from this? What do you think we learn from that? Um, David was at a low point in his life. Right? Everyone goes through low moments once in a while. But how do you think we should um, behave when we are at a low point in our lives? Silas. I think that when we are at our lowest point, mm -hmm. we should trust more in God than we usually trust in, in normal times. Mm -hmm. Because he's the one who's able to bring us back from that moment you're experiencing. All right, that is one thing as well. Probably another aspect I could bring out of this is um, Ellen White speaks about how David did not dwell in his low moments, in his moments of weakness and sadness. He chose to rise above the occasion. How can we learn from that, Brenda? Well, what are your thoughts? Um, I feel like it's something that people um, these days need to really um, learn. Mm -hmm. Because we like suicide cases keep going up and mm -hmm. depression. People are just like people are not mentally doing okay, mm -hmm. and it's mostly because they let what they're going through get get to them, mm -hmm. and they forget that they need to talk to God about it. They're like, "What will He do?" Like that's the first thing that comes to their head. When people are going through something, they're like, "It's God's fault." Everyone doesn't. No one gives God the glory when they're in victory or when they're doing well, but when the, something wrong is going in their life, that's when they think about God. They're like, mm -hmm. where is he now? Why is he not here? Mm -hmm. So I feel the lack in communication with God during tough times has brought a lot of people to have a lot of problems in their lives, being low physically, mentally. Mm -hmm. And I feel this, can, this, this habit or this character trait of rising above it will really help a lot of people. If people can just learn to trust in God fully, I feel like a lot of the problems we have in this society will just start disappearing because as long as you trust in God, everything else um, disappears. And I know I'm, I'm rushing a bit, but <laughs> I just I wanted to read something from the punchlines. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 41, 13, and it says, For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. So as long... I think this is what David did, and it's part of... Um, in other Psalms, he also talks about this, mm -hmm. how as he did not fear and he just trusted in the Lord. Yes, he had fear within him. Like It's, it's normal to have such emotions, mm -hmm. but because he trusted in God, he was able to overcome. So without God, it's a lot harder to do that. True, true. Thank yeah. you for that, Brenda. And actually, I was just about to go to the punchlines <laughs> as well, because yeah. uh, it speaks about how um, something you've brought up as well. When you are not in constant communication with God, it becomes hard um, to, be, um, to look up to him when you're in a tough situation. But then again, in the Bible, God makes his promises, but they still come with some conditions as well. Mm -hmm. okay? So I just want us to look at some punchlines and uh, see a promise in that verse, in the condition as well. We'll start with Ashley. You can just pick any of the punchlines. Just tell us where it's from, what promise is given there, and what condition does God put in place as well. My eyes immediately turned to Job 22, verses 21. Mm -hmm. And it says, Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, kindly remind me what I'm looking for. The so, promise? What is the promise that we see in that verse? The promise is that prosperity will come to you if you submit to God wholly. So submitting to God is the condition to that, right? Yes, and I'd like to point out, mm -hmm. in relation to the story, 
David submitted wholly to God and he succeeded in his venture to reclaim what was stolen by the Amalekites. Mm-hmm. Yes. Amen. That actually just ties directly to what we've been reading about how he defeated the Amalekites as well. Thank you for that, Ashley. Silas, what verse speaks to you here? And what promise do you see and what condition God gives so that that promise can be fulfilled? Uh, I think Psalms 38 verse 11. Mm -hmm. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay away from me. Mm, Okay. So in this verse... David is saying that his enemies avoid him because Mm -hmm. he has wounds, but he rejoices because those he he has had to overcome things Mm -hmm. to get where he is. Yeah, all right. Uh Actually, in in that verse, you can also see that um, David is speaking about how the closest people around you will tend to abandon you in times of trouble. Mm-hmm. But you can see he hasn't spoken about anywhere about how God abandons him. Because he knows as much as everyone else will go, uh, will go away from you in times of trouble, God is still there for you. All right? That is something you can pick from that as well. Now moving on, we um, can move now to uh, Thursday. The Thursday part, there's a verse that we have there to read. That's Job chapter 22, verse 21. That is the same verse that we've just read. I uh, probably can just uh, reiterate it a bit, and I'll ask Ashley to just uh, guide us through that, some questions in the Thursday part. Uh, yes. So the main question being asked is, do you know someone in your church, in your family, in your community, who is going through a tough time, who has been hurt or killed? Mm-hmm. And uh, what can you do to help this person and or their loved ones? So the first thing that one should do is first go to God Mm -hmm. and ask him how you can help in that situation. Mm -hmm. Then afterwards, you can now go to your friends, your family, your local pastor, and ask them for ideas on how you can help. All right. Thank you for that, Ashley. Um, Now, as we we just are about to come to the close of this, I'd like um, just to point out something. There is a story that is given um, in, the, in the teacher's section of the lesson, and it speaks about a young man who had temper issues. Okay. Now, this is also something that uh, we barely see David having. Now, let's imagine, put yourself in David's shoes. You have been chased away from your country, the only place you know that's home. You're the one who's supposed to be the next king. So by you being away, it means you the chances of you becoming king are very slim. And God had promised David you're going to become king because he'd already been anointed by Prophet Samuel. So David had all the rights to become angry, right? But we see two or three different times where David has the opportunity to kill Saul and take over the kingship, but he does not do that. Now let me give the story. There's a little boy who had anger issues, okay? And so his dad came up with a plan he gave this young man a couple of nails and a hammer. And he told him, every time you get angry, I want you to take one nail and hammer it into the wooden fence of our home. So by the end of that day, the boy had driven 37 nails into the fence. That's a very young guy, probably like younger than 10 years old, okay? But then um, his father told him that for the next few days, every time you get angry, keep hammering a nail into the fence. And as time progressed, the nails that were hammered to the fence became lesser and lesser. Until it came to a point where, um, for three days straight, no nail was hammered to the fence. The the young man told the father, Dad, I haven't become angry for the last few days, so there's no nail in the fence. And his dad told him, that is very good. Now I want you to do something. For every single day that you do not get angry, go to that fence, pull out one nail. And he did that few days, months, weeks, because there were a lot of nails there. And uh, once the young man was done, his father asked him, now, come to the fence. Look at the fence. What do you see? There are so many holes inside the fence. So the father told him, when you act out in anger, you make a damage that is irreparable. When you act out with emotion, when you make decisions based on anger, 
you may not be able to reverse the damages that it causes. That is one thing that David really learned and some that we can also pick as young people in our days. These days we are we're really much encouraged to be in tune with our emotions, right? It's a good thing. But it also means being in tune with the negative emotions, focusing on them. But that is not what God calls us to do. Learning from David, we need to learn how to rise above our anger. And that can only be done through the Holy Spirit and God's guidance. All right? Um, now, to finish up our lesson, I want us to read one verse. Psalm 38, verse 11. I'll ask Silas to read because he's read the same verse um, from the punchlines as well. Psalm 38, verse 11. You can just read it again. Psalm 38, verse 11 says, My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay away, stay far, far, far away. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so this ties back to the story about David and his men going back to their city in Ziklag and finding out that the Amalekites had taken everything from them. And a question that I can ask to us, this is just something to introspect and to our viewers as well. How did David's failure to trust God affect those around him? Because you see, it did have an effect. And actually pointed it out very well. David did not trust in God went, made an alliance with the Philistines, and the Amalekites were angered by this, and so they came and they took all the things that David and his men owned. So we see every single decision we make as well, it affects the people around us. So I want us to think, even you, uh, our viewer, just think about how much the decisions you make, how you failing to trust in God affects the people around you. And then number two, how do your failures to obey God affect the people as well? As we close, uh, we usually have a fundamental belief in every lesson, and our fundamental belief for this lesson nine is unity in the body of Christ. That's belief number 14. And uh, we see that David, as much as he had been exiled, he still, his heart still yearned for the people of Israel and the king. And as much as King Saul had died, David still showed unity by mourning for the king by even slaying the person who brought the purported good news that King Saul is dead. So this shows that we also need to be united as people. We should um, not um, rejoice over the death of our enemies or over the demise of our enemies, but instead just pray for them and just be saddened by the fact that God did not, they didn't get a chance to you know, see the goodness of God as well. As we finish up, uh, I'd like us to just read up uh, the further insight. I'll ask Ashley to read one, and then Brenda can read the other one. And it says, The angels of heaven are sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. Mm -hmm. All right, that's from the Desire of Ages. Uh We know that what results a day, an hour, or a moment may determine, and never should we begin the day without committing our ways to our Heavenly Father. His angels are appointed to watch over us, and if we put ourselves under the guard, guardianship, then in every time of danger, they will be at our right hand. Ellen G. White, Christ's Objective Lessons, page 341. Mm-hmm. That is uh, also another very good insight we might get. When we start each and every day, we are encouraged to commit our days to the Lord so that his angels may guide us each and every step of the way. Any final comments from uh, my panelists as we finish up? Let's start with Ashley. Uh, throughout the story, um, God works his wonders and miracles in David's life in ways that we may not recognize reading it for the first time. Mm-hmm. Like uh, the first time when David was sent away from the Philistine camp when they were marching forward to fight against Israel, that was actually God's doing, him being sent away. Mm-hmm. Uh, because David was uh, caught in a snare, kind of, because if he fought with the Philistines in that battle, he'd be labeled as a traitor to the the Israelites, and he'd lose his chances of becoming king. Mm -hmm. And if he backed out from fighting, he'd be labeled as a coward Mm -hmm. and ungrateful uh, for the hospitality that his host had shown him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and finally... um, 
from this lesson, we can all learn that we should be people after God's own heart, just mm. like David was. Because as much as he had his shortcomings, at the end of the day, he always went back to God. Amen. Amen. Silas, what do you have to tell us? For me, I think that David should, should love to God's anointed by mourning that he died and not rejoicing that he died because he was his enemy. And he should, the sincerity that no matter what your enemy does to you, wish them good. Amen. Amen. That also reminds me of how we know we have love when we love the people who deserve our love the least. You know, the people, the person who you think does not deserve your love, when you love them, that's when you know you really have true love. That's what David showed. Thank you for that. Brenda. Um, for me, two things I'd like to like just end with is that um, the first one is that because of David's uh, connection or the closeness or proximity he had with God, he, he worked on his relationship with God. And even though he had shortcomings, he made sure that even in the worst of my, of my time, whatever time it is, the worst I am, I will still pray to God, I will still talk to God. Even when he was angry, he would still talk to God, either in song, in poem, in whatever way he, in whatever time and in whatever way, he would still talk to God. And that gave him a relationship that made him know when is what time. That's why even when he had the chance to kill Saul, he didn't because he knew it was not yet his time. That's because of the connection he had with God. And the second thing is, um, I'd like to um, just repeat the promise and the condition given in Isaiah 41, 13. And the promise is that God will always help us in whatever time, in whatever problem we have, he will always help us. All, the only condition he gives us is not to fear. And sometimes this, is, this can be very hard, especially these days, um, depending in whatever situation you're in, either in school, some people are very scared about whatever it might be, their grades or relationships they have in school or at home, in, at work. It, like in, a, in any situation, God tells us not to fear and he will help us. So I just hope we can meditate upon that. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you, Ashley, uh, Silas and Brenda for that lesson. So that is the end of our lesson today. And uh, I'd just like to encourage you, if you have any question or comment as well, just write down on the comments and then we'll get back to you as well. Thank you for being with us throughout the lesson nine. We'll see you for the next lesson, lesson 10. But as we close, I'd like to ask Brenda to pray with us. Let's bow heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this day. We thank you for this beautiful lesson in which we learn about uh, the morning of David, the lament David had for Saul and his son, Lord, and the lessons in which we've drawn from this and the lessons we've known we can put in our lives so that we can be better Christians for you and for your heavenly kingdom. May we learn um, to, um, to, may we learn to be able to manage um, our emotions, not to um, act out in anger, but in love to everyone around us, even our enemies. As we continue with our, with, with our day, with our lives, may we continue to draw more lessons from this lesson as teens. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.